Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event, Sustainable Taxes and Economic Growth in the Post-COVID Era, the Role for European Multinational Companies. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based here in Brussels, and I'm coming at you live from the Euractive Studios in the heart of the EU quarter. Welcome to everyone here in the room and to joining us online for this hybrid event. Now, we know that the tax landscape has evolved over the last decade, and there's an increasing amount of distrust between various segments of society. In particular, there's been a mistrust in large businesses and a concern that globalization has benefited larger companies rather than the population at large. The COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated inequalities and public deficits, with governments facing the dual challenge of responding to emerging and addressing the, to the emerging crisis and the emergencies resulting from COVID, and also addressing the economic fallout. Now, this has ultimately led to calls for greater transparency and reforms of international tax rules, including OECD Pillars 1 and 2, and EU country-by-country -country public reporting, and more. Now, with the changing business environment, volatility in the energy markets, and tightening of the financial markets, large multinational companies have been forced to quickly adapt and innovate. At today's event, we'll be discussing the role of resilience of European multinationals in contributing to public finances and the social welfare system during the pandemic and the recovery afterwards. What is the current level of total tax contributions made by MNCs following the pandemic? And how has it changed compared to previous years? We're going to start out with presentations of two studies. The first is looking at total tax contribution, and the second is looking at sustainability and taxation. And this will be followed by a panel discussion in which we'll discuss these issues more generally. So now, to get us started, I would like to introduce Michael Ludlow, who is chair of the European Business Tax Forum and group head of tax at Swiss Re. Michael? Thank you very much, Dave, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. So it's my pleasure to welcome you all on behalf of the EBTF, um, that's the European Business Tax Forum. Uh, we are effectively behind the presentations you're going to hear today, having put together the study on the TTC, as well as supporting with the University of St. Gallen on the study on sustainability. Um, and my colleagues will tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. But before I do that, I'd just like to introduce the uh, other people you're going to meet today. So. As I said, my name is Michael Ludlow. Um, I'm the head of group tax at Swiss Re, but more personally for these purposes, I'm the chair of the EBTF. Um, I will be followed by Mai Trin, who is the um, head of tax risk, I think tax risk reporting and quite interesting reputation as well um, at Relex, which is probably the first time I've seen reputation put specifically in the job title. She'll be talking a bit about the TTC we're going to go through. Um, we'll then pass over to Professor Peter Hongler, who is professor of tax law at the University of St. Gallen. Um, Peter was involved in leading on the university's work regarding the sustainability project, so really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Um, and then we're going to have a panel discussion that was mentioned, and, and in the panel discussion we'll be joined by Edwin Visser, who is the Deputy Global Tax Policy Lead for PwC, and also Kurt Van Dender, who is the Acting Head of ta policy, on Tax Policy at the pol sorry, Tax Policy and Statistics Division of the OECD. So sounds like a really great panel, um, including myself, and I don't mean that the great bit, um, but the rest of the panellists look fantastic, so looking forward to that. So before we do that, though, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up on what the EBTF are, for, um, for those of you who don't know. So the European Business Tax Forum was formed about six years ago. Um, effectively, it's a thought leadership group, um, and I did actually have a slide on this one, so let me share that with you. Thank you very much. It's a thought leadership group of the, uh, of the largest multinationals in your, in the, headquartered in the EU and, and the UK and EFTA. And, and really what, what EBTF tries to do is it tries to open up the tax debate a little bit more to objective analysis. So I think, uh, as it was outlined by Dave at the beginning, there's been a lot of scrutiny in the media. There's been a lot of discussion around tax and the contributions that MEs make. The EBTF thinks that that debate is useful, um, and all of our members are very committed to that debate. But what we do want to do is we want to make sure that we can add objective data to that debate. So it doesn't become skewed by particular narrative or people's political views. So that's really where we come on board. Um, and, and really the backbone of what we do then is the TTC, the Total Tax Contribution Work, which is 
what Mai's going to talk to you about shortly. Um, this will be the fifth year we've put together a total tax contribution report, which takes into account the 100, well, up to the 100 largest companies across Europe. I think we're up to 67 this year, which is fantastic, up from 61 last year, and amalgamates all those reports. But I won't steal Mai's fund, I would give you any more there. Um, I think it's a really useful organization to be part of, and obviously part of my job is also here is to pitch it a little bit to those people who may be interested in getting involved. Um, we do have certain categories of membership which are relatively uh, affordable. So as you can see here, we have full member, uh, which is really for the European headquarters companies, and that's about 15,000 euros. We also have a new category coming in called observer membership, which is for the increasing interest we're getting from companies headquartered outside of Europe, but also a big presence here in Europe who want to get involved in this debate. As I said, I think we're all seeing an increase in this area and people being involved, so it's, it's really good to get, to get out on top of that. Why would you want to become a member of the organisation? I think really there were three benefits to me. So firstly, it gives us that chance to shape the debate, and that's the most important part of this. But secondly, it also gives an opportunity to network. And so in this room, we have a number of like-minded individuals who will be talking to us after the event, and we get to talk and actually understand best practice and share with each other. And that's great from a personal perspective as well. And then, and then finally, I think there is something around reputation of your own businesses as well. Um, we do ask that all members of the EBTF are signed up in principle to the B team's uh, responsible tax principles. And so we all have that kind of shared, affirmed uh, sort of support for the reputational piece of that. And, and having the EBTF as, that, as a membership thing helps that reputation. So what do we do? Um, as I've mentioned, the TTC really is the backbone, but that's not the only project we do. Um, as well as working with the University of St. Gallen, we've also got a, a couple of other publications. So I would love to steer you towards our website and also towards LinkedIn to get a little bit more information on these. So you can see here we've done an upcoming publication on good tax governance, which really looks at you know, what is the best practice around the G part of ESG and tax in that world. Um, and we've also got a really interesting report we released this year with the University of Amsterdam, which was looking at how is tax covered in the media in Europe. And that's some, some of the findings in there, I think, are really insightful in terms of how the debate has shaped over the last 10 years. And you'll be unsurprised to know that the narrative tends to be relatively negative when it comes to multinationals, which is why I think we, as the EBTF, continue to have a really big um, and active role in this process. So um, on the slide here, you'll see, and we'll put that up again at the end, we've got um, a website and we've also got a big LinkedIn presence. So please do take a look at that if you get a chance. Um, and before... We do that, though. I think the most important thing is probably to hear the results of the studies. So I will pass on, without any further ado, uh, to Mai, who will talk you through the total tax contribution for 2022. Thank you very much, Mai. So thank you very much um, for the introduction, Michael. It's lovely to see some of you in person today and to even many more of you who are able to join us virtually. So welcome to the presentation, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time to be here with us today. So as Michael mentioned, I am Mai, I'm Head of Tax Risk Reporting and Reputation at Relix. Relix is a member of EBTS and have been a member for the last five years. And it has been great to um, work alongside other European multinational companies uh, on a journey towards greater tax transparency and together raising the bar in the public tax debate. Total tax contribution is an important part of that journey and so it is a real pleasure for me to be able to present to you the results of the fifth edition of the total tax contribution study of the largest companies headquartered in Europe. So what is the purpose of the study? Well, on a macro level, we are living in a world and grappling with significant challenges of high inflation, cost of living crisis, climate change. And it is crucial to have the right balance of taxation to support economic recovery. The purpose of the study is to provide comprehensive and fact-based data and shine a light on the taxes that multinationals pay and the role that uh, those companies uh, play in the societies in which we operate. Within the tax world, we also have um, the implementation of Pillar 2 and the EU public, com public by country, country by country reporting, which um, increases the demand for robust data to inform the public debate. So what is total tax contribution in a nutshell? 
Well, it relates to the five P's uh, of um, taxes. So first you've got profit taxes, which are the taxes on profit and income. Then you have product taxes, which relates to goods and services. Property taxes relate to taxes on property. Then we also have people taxes, which relate to the employment of staff. And planet taxes relates to goods and services that may harm the environment. So coming on to this year's study, so as Michael mentioned, we have invited the largest companies in Europe by revenue and market cap. And when I first started um, five years ago, we had 41 uh, participants. And that number has been steadily increasing over the last few years. And this year, we're absolutely delighted that we've got a record amount of uh, companies who participated. So we've got 67 companies. And that shows a strong support of the multinationals for the total tax contribution framework and for its role in enhancing tax transparency. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the companies who have taken part in this year's study. I think it's really uh, great. Everybody's really busy. So we uh, appreciate the time that you have taken to be part of the study. And for those of you who are listening but you're not part of the study yet we very much hope that you'll be with us next year because the bigger the report and the more participants we've got the more insightful analysis that we can draw from that <coughs> the study is conducted by pwc and we've been working with pwc uh, for the past few years uh, very much working in partnership and pwc uh, have been able to uh, spend a lot of time to uh, pull together the report and provide the data as well as the insights and analysis. So we very much appreciate that. And as an illustration of the batch volume of data that's been processed, the survey looks at five um, industries, 14 sectors, 180 territories and 1,900 questionnaires. So what are the key results? The results show that the companies that participate in the study pay an unprecedented amount of um, taxes in 2022, reflecting the remarkable financial performance. The total tax contribution of the 67 companies amounted to 505 billion euros, split between 40%, 47% of taxes borne and 53% of taxes collected. So to provide you with some perspective, this represents more than the 2022 tax receipts of four countries, uh, which are Netherlands, Hungary, Slovak Republic, and Luxembourg. And the total tax contribution also equates to 63 euros for every um, living person in the world. So as you know, the scrutiny on taxes paid have been largely on corporate income taxes. Um, and the study actually shows a comprehensive um, study of all taxes uh, contributed. So for every euro of corporate income taxes paid, um, the participating companies also pay 65 uh, pence of other taxes and they also collect one euro 89 pence of taxes for governments. The companies also generate employment for 4.2 million people worldwide, and that equates to 18,500 euro um, of taxes per employee. So that also real, um, highlights the contribution of the large European companies to economy through job creation and retention. In terms of the profile of taxes born, so the taxes born of 235 billion euros, uh, that represents a big increase compared to the previous year. And this mainly relates to increase in profitability because uh, many companies are recovering from the COVID-19 and um, 
also there's also uh, improved profitability in sectors such as uh, energy, utilities and resources and financial services. You may also note that uh, planet taxes uh, only account for 1.4% of the total tax contribution. So this is quite a small number and given the current environmental challenge that the world is facing, we won't be surprised if there'll be more legislative developments in this area in the future. Coming to uh, taxes collected, so taxes collected of 270 billion euros have also increased from the previous year, although at a slower rate. These are driven by increases in product taxes, especially those collected in the energy, utilities and uh, resources industry. And also that represents increases in people taxes because there have been an uptick of hiring uh, of staff in the post-COVID world. So our study not only um, provide the data, but we also try to provide the context. And one useful one is the total tax rate. So you'll be very familiar with the effective tax rate, which looks at corporate income taxes, but the total tax rate um, actually represent the total taxes borne as a percentage of profit before all business taxes. And in 2022, the total tax rate is 40.9% which is a very significant uh, number, and it represents the importance of all other taxes borne by companies in addition to corporate income taxes. So we've been able to also look at the European total tax contribution trends over the last five years. And you can see that um, the profile has been relatively stable over the last uh, five years. So people taxes is still the largest um, out of the uh, total tax contribution, and that's about a third of taxes contributed by companies. We also have enough data to take a deeper dive into the 14 countries um, this year. So this chart looks at the total taxes borne by the five um, tax bases. And one interesting insight to draw from this is that um, every country uh, follows different policies and hey, they have different uh, sources of tax receipts. So for example, you can see France at the top of this chart who rely heavily on people taxes and they have the highest rate of employment taxes uh, as a percentage of taxes borne and that is 39%. Um, other things that we can draw from this chart as well is that there are some countries who, whose profit taxes uh, represent more than 50% of the total tax contribution. And those countries are Switzerland, Singapore, Australia, India and Netherlands. So, in summary, the study provides a comprehensive and consistent measure of total tax contribution of multinational companies uh, to public finances. We have a record amount of 67 uh, participants this year, and that reflects commitment towards uh, tax transparency and dialogue. The study reveals the diversity of tax systems and rates across the different economies. The study shows that the Participants pay an unprecedented amount of uh, taxes in 2022 and the total tax contribution is the highest ever recorded in the study. So this demonstrates the resilience and contribution of companies in terms of sustainable taxes and economic growth in the post-COVID world. So thank you very much and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the session.
Thanks very much, Mai. Some super interesting stats there that we're going to dive into during the panel. Next, we're going to hear about the sustainability and taxation study. And for that presentation, I would like to welcome to the podium Professor Peter Hongler, Professor of Tax Law at the University of St. Gallen. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm just waiting for my slides. <laughs> so, yes, um, it has been a fascinating two years. Uh, we have worked uh, with the EBTF on a, a study on uh, recommendations in the tax area. So how multinational enterprises should behave in order to be considered uh, sustainable. And I'll guide you through our main findings. Now, uh, we started with looking at uh, some standard setters, and I'll you know, go into more details in a minute, what they require or what they consider as sustainable tax behavior. And then we compared their approach, their recommendations, with what rating agencies do. Um, they are ESG rating agencies, and these ESG rating agencies are very important, both for multinational enterprises, but also for investors. So we looked at what they require from a tax uh, perspective. And we did a survey um, with internal stakeholders to find out what the internal stakeholders, so the people working for multinationals, consider as sustainable tax behavior uh, or non-sustainable tax behavior. So let's start with the recommendation. And I think that is the first fascinating uh, uh, conclusion. We looked at the recommendations developed by the Team B. Michael mentioned that already. GRI recommendations by the World Economic Forum, but also binding recommendations such as the requirement in the UK to publish a tax strategy. Overall, we found more than 90 <laughs> different recommendations in the tax field. Uh, of course, there are always slight deviations, but it's fascinating to see that we have a variety of recommendations that are used to assess whether a company is considered to be a sustainable company from a tax perspective. I've I make three examples. So, for instance, there is the recommendation to publish a tax strategy. So you're considered to be a sustain. Now I simplify a bit. You're considered to be a sustainable M&E if you publish a tax strategy. Second um, uh, example is, for instance, that you pay more taxes than your competitors. Because if you pay more taxes than your competitor, you're considered to be sustainable. And maybe a last example, uh, one recommendation is that you involve yourself in the public discourse on how to design uh, tax policy systems. So this is very, very interesting. So we have a variety of recommendations that are currently in the market. And, and we try to, you know, then uh, ask rating agencies. Again, ESG rating agencies, so these rating agencies, they have a focus on assessing whether a company is considered to be a sustainable company or not. Sorry, I simplify a bit here uh, because it's easier to transfer the key messages. And we had, you know, um, a, a discussion with representatives of uh, probably uh, some of the most important ESG ratings, uh, rating agencies. And of course, it's always a snapshot. So uh, the uh, results you have here, maybe they're already different now uh, because rating agencies, they all also change their approach constantly. And that's not, you know, I'm not blaming rating agencies that they do that uh, because they're also living in a dy dynamic world. So what are the results? The results are that the rating agencies in general, they have quite a different approaches on how to figure out which company now receives a triple A rating and which company maybe receives only a single A rating. For instance, most rating agencies, they you know, calculate some numbers and maybe the number 100 is the maximum you can get. So 100 points and you're fully sustainable, you get a triple A rating. So the question is how important is taxation? And here our numbers show that taxation is maybe up to 10%. So between 0% and 10% of your overall ESG rating. But it really depends on the rating agency. So in some cases, maybe it's only 3%. In other cases, maybe it's only 5%. So the approaches rating agencies take is, is rather different. I think that's, a, that's an important uh, conclusion. Now, of course, we still don't know <laughs> what you know, tax behavior is decisive to figure out whether you are an outperformer 
or whether you're an underperformer for performer in the tax field, whether you get all points in the tax pillar or we get or whether you, you don't get all of at the points. So this is why we also wanted to know from rating agencies, what do you consider a sustainable tax behavior uh, by a multinational? And before I go, I guide you through the details, I think it's, it's always important that in the ESG area or the sustainability area, two goals need to, de need to be uh, distinguished. One goal is that we want to figure out what the impact is a company has. And the other goal is that the company wants to know what are my risks in the sustainability field. And these goals are mingled. They're mingled all the time. And the tax field is a great field to demonstrate why these goals are mingled. So again, one goal is what is the impact the company has on the environment, on social topic, etc. And the other goal is to figure out what is the risk that these topics, like, sustain, like sustainability topics, have on a multinational business. And this is why we also see both worlds here on the slides. On the left side, for instance, you have one rating agency that only looks at tax controversies. So is a multinational involved in tax controversies? If yes, you get a bad rating. If not, you get a good rating. On the other side, you have other rating agencies that apply a, a, a completely different approach because they look at whether you are based in tax havens, whether uh, you have governance structures in place, whether you uh, commit yourself to be part of a public debate on changing uh, tax systems. So we have a variety of approaches here. And I think that is an important conclusion. Always when we see such a variety, I think we need to discuss which one is you know, the, most, the most efficient way of how we should judge whether a multinational is sustainable or not. So we face difficulties here. Both investors face difficulties because they might rely on one of these ratings, but also multinationals face difficulties because they receive a lot of questionnaires from different rating agencies, but also from investors, and they get a lot of different questions. Are you involved in tax planning? You get tax incentives from governments, etc. But you don't know what is going to happen with these answers. So that's, I think, an important conclusion of, of phase one. So key takeaway here, we have a variety of categories. So out of the 93 recommendations that we found, uh, we build up some categories that are commonly used to assess. But even looking at these categories, it's still unclear what is good behavior and what is bad behavior uh, in, the tax, in the tax field. Every standard setter, I think, has a, a different logic behind. And the logic is either I look mainly at risk assessment or I look mainly at an impact assessment. And again, the topics are mingled. So you have rating agencies, they do both. You have standard setters, they do both. And you have some that focus on one of the two areas. So I think um, that having said that, I, I move on to phase number two. Now, phase number two here, we wanted to better understand whether internal stakeholders in a multinational enterprise, what they consider to be, again, good and bad tax behavior. And in order to do that, we first, and I just have, you know, two questions here. You find the complete questionnaire in the, the written study. I have two questions here on the, on the slide. The first question was, uh, imagine you had the resources and capabilities to take the topic of sustainable development into your hands. What would be your main priority issues to tackle in your company? And now, not, not surprisingly, to be honest, fair taxation is rather at the bottom. So it's number 10. So if you have the power to change something in your multinational enterprise, people would focus on CO2 emissions, fair employment and energy consumption. Now, what is, what is the, the underlying issue here? The underlying issue is with taxation, we only have an indirect impact. And this is something we have discussed extensively also um, between you know, members of the EBTF and, and us. And because all, if you want to assess the impact a company has with tax payments, well, it depends on how governments spend the money. So it's very difficult to give 
a clear metric, to give a clear calculation whether company A has a higher impact than company B just by looking at tax payments. I'm not, I'm not saying that, of course, multinationals should not pay taxes. It's very important that you contribute. But it's difficult to give an exact calculation which multinational has more impact than the other one just by looking at tax payments. And, and the issue here is that it's on, only an indirect impact. So it depends on what governments do. If you pay taxes in one country, you might even have a negative impact on the sustainable development goals. If you pay uh, taxes in another country, you might have a huge positive impact on the sustainable development goals. And that is something we should never, never forget. Second example here, we also ask these in internal stakeholders, you know, if you have the two goals in mind, so one goal, again, impact, second goal, risk for the company, which categories or which recommendations would you conceive to be a good or bad? Uh, and here, you know, for instance, on the left side, on the impact side, you see that corruption is considered to be uh, very important for the impact side. So here, I think we have an unconditional uh, recommendation that we should reduce tax corruption in order to enhance our impact. If we look at the business value, at the risks, of course, tax governance is at the top because this is how we, we reduce uh, tax risks within our uh, multinational enterprise. Of course, we, it, it was not a huge number of respondents, so we should be you know, careful to use these results for policy recommendations. But I think it's just important to see that, get, that again, if we think about what is good for, for the impact and what is good for the risk side, uh, it uh, differs a lot. So, how to proceed? <laughs> and that was our last task. Um, to outline maybe a way forward, because the current way is not, uh, is not one we should continue to move on, because it's chaos. It's pure chaos. We have too many recommendations in the market, and rating agencies approach it differently. So it's neither for investors clear what they can do with an ESG rating in the tax field, nor for the multinational. Uh, they uh, really understand what they should do in order to be considered um, uh, sustainable. So we, dis we distinguished uh, between you know, the risk side and the impact side. If we look at the risk side, uh, I think we have to differentiate between reputational risk and financial risk. Of course, reputational risk can always be a financial risk. If you look at the reputation of a multinational, I think the only thing you can do is to do a stakeholder analysis. And for each multinational, the stakeholder analysis will be different. So in some cases, uh, you can, and I you know, exaggerate here a bit, you can do aggressive tax planning without any impact on the reputational side, because maybe you're in a B2B field. But on a B2C, in a B2C business, maybe if you do aggressive tax planning, that can have a huge impact on your reputation. So the reputational side really depends on each multinational. With respect to financial risk, I'd be very short here. Of course, some of the governance recommendations that are in the market are important to reduce financial risk, such as, you know, a proper corporate tax governance structure in place. Very difficult is the impact side. And here again, we should never forget that everything we recommend should have an unconditional positive impact. Okay? I repeat, so everything we recommend to multinationals to do should have an unconditional positive impact. Because if that's not the case, these recommendations can also be used to offset ratings, bad ratings in other areas, such as environment or social. So if you think what is a recommendation that has an unconditional impact, I think one of the only things we can do is really focus on corruption. Because all of us would agree, you know, in the corruption area, you can do something positive by reducing the risks that you are involved in, or you or your advisors are involved in corrupt, uh, cor corruptive practices or bribery around, around the globe. So that might not sound very sexy, to be honest, uh, but at the end I think it's better to have clarity and to have an agreement on the few recommendations that a few recommendations that we really can enforce that have an unconditional positive impact on the sustainable development goals then to ask you know 
too many uh, recommendations from multinational enterprise and then mix everything together which increases the risks that these you know that the tax area is used to offset bad ratings uh, in in, uh, uh, in in other uh, pillars of an ESG rating now I don't want to be misunderstood and then I'm done with my presentation I, I don't want to be misunderstood that you know governance should not be in favor of public CBCR or government should not be in favor of uh, challenging aggressive tax planning. Of course, governments need to look at that, but we need to be careful to value, to try to assess multinational from a multinational enterprises from a sustainability perspective on what they do in the tax area, because it all depends on what the governments uh, do with the money. So we cannot really assess the direct impact a, a multinational has um, uh, in the tax field. And I think that is something we, we should understand going forward. Having said that, looking at the time, I think I'm done with my remarks. So thank you. You have some key takeaways here, but I think that the key takeaways were already presented in my presentation. So thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Peter. So I think both of those studies gave us a lot to talk about during our panel. Uh, so let me invite our panelists up to the, po to the stage now. Uh, so we have with us here already, you've heard from Michael and Peter. Uh, so I'd like to welcome them up to the stage. And in addition, we have Edwin Visser, who's Deputy Global Tax Policy Leader at PwC. And we have Kurt Van Dender, who is acting head of the Tax Policy and Statistics Division at the OECD. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us for the panel. Now, you guys, both here in the room and watching online, will be able to ask your questions to the panelists. You'll be able to do that using Slido. Uh, so if you're here in the room, you can scan that barcode that's on the screen, and that'll take you to Slido, where you can type in your questions, and I will put them to the panelists at the end of the panel. Uh, if you're watching online, you should have that uh, field right there where you're watching. Now, if you go on Slido right now, you're also going to find links to both of the studies uh, that were just presented. So you can get those uh, in their full content there on the site. Um, so, Edwin, I'd like to start with you. Um, given the, the, both of the studies that we just heard, they're both on total tax contributions and on sustainability. What's your take on what you think is the appropriate role for multinational companies for sustainable taxation systems? Uh, thanks, Dave. Yeah, the mic works, I think. I would like to take a bit of a different angle, if you allow me, from more a taxation mix perspective look at things. I looked at some key economic data and tax data of the OECD and the European Union, the annual taxation report, the revenue statistics report, but also the IMF fiscal monitor of April and October this year. And what you see as a general picture is low economic growth for the coming years, I think. Um, debt levels have risen since the financial and economic crisis. Interest rates are high and are likely to stay. That for the coming period is the expectation. Um, and we see uh, in, in emerging and advanced economies stagnating tax revenues, according to the IMF. It's a flat curve, and it will stay a flat curve for the coming years. Only in uh, low-income uh, economies, there's still growth in the tax-to-GDP ratio. And if you combine that with a higher demand for public goods, like defense, for example, the Ukraine war, tension in Southeast Asia around Taiwan, um, increased demand for healthcare, I think, as a public good, education, etc., then the question is how sustainable is this, and what is the way forward? Um, when you look at, for example, the net zero transformation, the IMF said if that were to be financed only by debt, that would lead to an increase of debt levels by 50%. That is unsustainable. So you need fiscal policies in addition to, to debt. Um, well, if you then look at, for example, the European Union with an average tax to GDP ratio of 40%, then you can wonder how much room is there to maneuver, huh? because simply saying, okay, we need more money for the increased demand of public goods, so we raise taxes. Well, if you look at a 40% tax to GDP ratio, which is quite high uh, compared to the rest of the world, that cannot be the only answer. What you also see in the European Union is that the dependency on labor taxation is quite high. Uh, we saw the, uh, uh, the pictures, in, it differs a bit per country, but overall it's 
51%, 51% of total tax revenue in the European Union uh, constitutes of labor taxes and social tax, social contributions. So that is quite high. With an aging population, I don't think that is that is sustainable, unsustainable. When you look at environmental taxes or planet taxes in the study of uh, of the EBTF, that is still a very modest part of the total tax revenue. So there is room there, I think. Um, there's evidence, I looked at some older studies, 2008, 2010, that different tax structures, but also different taxation mixes could be less distortive to economic growth and make tax revenues more stable and sustainable. Income taxes, not surprisingly, corporate income taxes, personal income taxes are the most distortive taxes there are from an economic growth perspective. Uh, property taxes, transaction taxes are least distortive. So, and, and when you look at corporate income taxes and consumption taxes, well, they're even more efficient, I think. That's what the study says, if they have a broad base and a low tax rate. When I look at the current system, I think, you know, we, we are far away from this ideal situation. A different balance in the taxation mix with a potential to uh, not hamper the economic growth uh, that, that much. Um, and countries and policymakers often do the contrary. They they narrow the tax base by incentives, increase the rate, so making tax systems less efficient. There's hardly any debate in the European Union whether a low VAT rate, for example, makes sense from an economic perspective. And of course, I know that VAT is, is sort of regressive and that if you abolish the low tax rate that you have to do something as a policymaker, as a government, to redistribute you know, the additional revenues to lower household incomes. But what I'm saying is we should not have only a debate about higher taxes to, to meet all the demands of the future, but have a debate about a smarter and economic, more efficient uh, taxation mix. That sense? Kurt, let's go to you next. So based on what we've just heard in both of these studies, what do you think is the appropriate role for multinational companies for sustainable taxation systems? Thank you very much for that question and thanks for the invitation. Um, I was really quite interested to, to be able to take a sneak preview at, at both of these studies and, and, and see what's in there. A um, um, first observation that I would make is, so today we are at the OECD, we're releasing our OECD revenue statistics uh, update released uh, today. Um, and as usual, we have some communication around it where we try to identify main findings. And some of these main findings are really quite close to, to some of the things that we heard here today in, in the TTC study. So that's quite remarkable. So, um, this, you know, revenue statistics is different, right? I mean, it's about the total tax revenue raised by governments across all taxes. So it's a quite different perspective and, and, and approach to, to how the TTC study works, but still quite similar. Excise tax cuts. So this is in the energy space. Uh, excise tax cuts. Depressed demand for energy following the energy price hikes, we observe that this leads to a um, reduction in the share of excise tax revenue uh, in, in, in GDP. Actually, in 34 of the 36 countries that we look at, we see that these revenues fall. Um, similar findings, I think, in, in, in the study there. Um, this translates, by the way, into an increase since uh, we, you were talking about SDG uh, indicators. If you look at SDG indicator 12C1, which is the fossil fuel subsidy indicator, there you see a massive increase because of these tax cuts. Um, so that's one observation in the energy space. Then CIT revenue. CIT re revenue is up as a share of revenue in three quarter of the countries that, that, we, uh, that we look at. So it's 36 of the 38. Um, 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 OECD countries are in our study. This is, as was mentioned in the presentation, mainly because of higher profits. That's the main, that's the main reason. So excise down, CIT up, also a bit of an increase uh, in, in PIT in some countries. The net effect, the net effect is that tax revenues come down, which is compared to last year, of course, 20, I mean 2022 over 2021. It has come down if you compare it to 2019. However, the last pre-COVID year, you will see that revenues are, uh, are up again. So it's not entirely stable. We can discuss what stable means and what a meaningful change is. Uh, but uh, there are some changes which, which we think are sufficiently important uh, to observe. 
So in that general context, so these are changes that we see too. What's the role for MEs in, in a sustainable tax system? Um, taking a step back, the question is, what's a sustainable tax system, right? What does it take for a tax system to, to be perceived as sustainable? The standards public finance take on this has been, it should be effective and efficient in raising the revenues that government needs, right? That's the standard public finance view. That then has been augmented, we should look at equity as well. That has been augmented, there should be taxpayer trust, there should be tax morale which comes into the equation as well. I think we are now moving into a phase where there's an additional factor where um, we look at tax policy, revenue raising as a key objective obviously, but also looking at other objectives, namely how does tax policy contribute to things like the green tra transition, how does it contribute to inclusiveness, which is a broader concept than just uh, income inequality. So all these things are now going, coming into equation and uh, that's what these are the demands put on tax policy. Obviously, this introduces quite complex uh, trade-offs that, that we need uh, to be considering. Um, and as was mentioned by, by Edwin, the macroeconomic context is kind of putting the pressure on, right? All these trade-offs trade become much more pronounced in a situation where the fiscal space is under pressure, under pressure from two sides, a need for more spending because of various of the trends that were measured, and the need also uh, to, to therefore uh, raise more revenue. So um, um, these trade-offs, the sustainability of tax as a tax system, as a fiscal policy uh, component is going to become quite prominent, I think. What's the place of m and on this? Just a couple of short observations initially. There is some evidence of improved sustainability, right? In the sense that the statutory rates have been coming down for a quite long time uh, in the past decade, 15 years, but today it's a bit different. We see some st stabilization of, of uh, rates. So that's some improvement in uh, sustainability. Uh, but we're also seeing um, in the green space, for example, an increased use of tax incentives, narrowing the base. Uh, how does that work? How does it interact with the headline? Um, um, sustainability of taxation is, is going to be quite important. An interesting thing that your TTC data highlight, I think, is that CIT is only part of the tax system that uh, multinationals are involved with, right? Uh, they pay or remit a whole range of other taxes, property taxes, various green taxes, per personal taxes. So m and have an important function there in the taxes that they pay, but also in the taxes that they administer, uh, that they remit. So they play a, a key role there, and I think we need, uh, we need to take that into account. Um, reliable administration, transparent administration of tax systems is very important, and the role of m and there is much more important than a CIT focus in itself alone would, would suggest. So that's what I would observe to start with. Michael, what about you? What was your your main reactions to both of these studies? And based on what we're hearing here, what would you say is the appropriate role for taxation for multinationals to be sustainable? Sure. So, I mean, firstly, I, I thought that was a really interesting um, outline from, from my two colleagues there because it, it give, really gives that wider context in terms of what is sustainable tax, which I think is a really good question. Um, and when you sit where I sit as a multinational, Within the multinational, as, as a head of tax within an organisation, you see an increasing amount of pressure upon a multinational. And it does feel a little bit like that's all going in one direction. So I think it's really important that we do have that debate around what is sustainable um, in the tax system to make sure we get there. In terms of what is the role of the MNE, um, well, you know, reverting back to what Mai talked about, it's clear it's huge. So half a trillion dollars, uh, sorry, half a trillion euros uh, contribution from the 67 biggest companies that we had in our survey. I mean, that, that's a revenue that can't easily be replaced. And then, uh, as Kurt was saying, it's not just about the taxes we pay, it's about the taxes that we also collect on that behalf. And then it's the wider economic impact as well. So for everybody who works, they pay their employment taxes, they have dependents, they have family contributions, they support the economy in that way as well, and the, their spending, et cetera. So there's a kind of a, a rolled-on effect that we have to recognise that MNEs have in this space. Um, as I said, coming sort of looking at from the inside, um, we see uh, sort of a continuing trend of harder and tougher tax audits and such like coming forward. And we have to now balance how do we get the right balance between what the level of contribution from a total 
tax contribution is from an MNE with what, what they can afford to do and how we can manage that. So we look at things like the, the legacy of COVID, um, you know, the deficits that the governments have got around the world and, uh, and my colleagues here have just spoken about that probably more than I can. But that's led to a trend where we see much more aggressive audits. If you add into that the fact we now have all digitalization, tax authorities have got much access to much better tools to analyze data, to compare you to your peers, because we've, as our tax colleagues on the call would know, we've all been uh, submitting our country by country information for several years. That's going to go public in a, in a year or so for EU headquartered companies. This gives the tax authorities an unrivaled approach, really, and the ability to really look at data in a quick, timely, comparable fashion. And we're seeing a trend then where um, basically audits become much more um, assessment based. There used to be quite a big, long academic exercise between masses of tax policy and arguing around different clauses, et cetera. But now it's much more about this is what we think you owe. Prove us wrong. And we've got to find that balance if this is going to be a sustainable tax system, because otherwise the M&Es are going to creak, frankly, too much under that strain, and that, that tax take won't continue to be made. I think maybe just one other point I wanted to make was um, following up again on what Kurt said is there's a behavioural change piece here that M&Es are also driving. Um, the shift to planet taxes, 1.2%, I think Mai told us about. I mean, that's, that's really low, right? I mean, and, and if we really want to see a change in behaviour here, we've got to think about how can we get that tax shift working more effectively. Um, I appreciate fully that's going to have um, some complications as you don't want to pay more tax. And equally, if you pay more tax, it means you're emitting more carbon, for example, in, in the case of green taxes, which is not a good thing. But we do need to make sure that we're penalising that so that we get to a stage where we can actually change behaviour. And I think MNEs in themselves are probably more effective vehicles for doing that than certain aspects of policy, because a lot of policy tends to be quite uh, reactive at the moment and relatively short term as well. P uh, Peter, let's turn to you. So we've heard there some of the reactions to the study. Um, do you have any responses to what you've heard so far uh, in the reactions? And then I also wonder if you could also give your more general take on what the appropriate role is for MNEs with sustainable taxation. Yes, maybe just, you know, again, for me, it's really important to highlight, <laughs> you know, the goal of my presentation or the goal of our study was not to demonstrate that multinationals do not play an important role in the area of sustainability, but to demonstrate that we should be very careful to make comparison between multinational A and multinational B just based on their tax behavior. So this is really, I think that's even dangerous because it can be counterproductive. Uh, but of course, multinationals are extremely important to achieve the sustainable development goals. And we just heard the numbers that CIT revenues are going up. And I think that demonstrates how important, you know, an efficient environment, an efficient economy is for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. But I think I have not a more, or maybe one, one thing to add, but that's just for the future. I think what we'll, what we'll see now in the next couple of months is also a, a huge transition from, from tax incentives to the spending side to subsidies. Because of the global minimum tax, we have already seen first you know, proposals by, by governments such as Barbados, you know, introducing qualified tax credits uh, where you spend 100 and you get 300 from the government. So in the future, I think that will be a key element also of a total tax contribution uh, study to assess also what you might get back from the government through subsidies. Because, you know, the tax incentive role, I think, is basically harmonized now or is going to be harmonized in the future through the global minimum tax. So the competition will be on a, on a different angle in the future. Um, but I think that these are my, my comments, yes. Um, thanks, Peter. Just a reminder, you guys, if you have questions for the panelists, can put your questions in on Slido, and I will put your question to the panelists. I want to zoom out now and talk about some of the macroeconomic factors that all of this is taking place in, the kind of wider context. Um, Kurt, you'd be a good person to, to ask about this. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have a changing business environment. We have volatility in the energy markets. We have tightening of financial markets. We have inflation. We have all kinds of uh, geopolitical concerns right now. Uh, what is the effect of all of this on large multinational companies, and how has this intersected with tax burdens? Right. Thank you for that question. I mean, indeed, we are not in a particularly stable uh, macroeconomic environment, uh, and that is being combined with 
long-term trends that are beginning to manifest themselves and they're triggering policy action, which will, I think, become increasingly, you know, stringent over time in the green space, in the population aging space and all these kinds of things. Um, I think what it uh, ultimately means is, is uh, what two of us at least uh, pointed to in, in, in our introductions, namely that um, there will be pressure to raise more revenues um, and that there will be pressure to raise more, uh, to, to increase spending in, in a number of areas, and that this is something that um, all taxpayers, including MEs, uh, will, will uh, be exposed to, to, to that uh, pressure. Um, there are tools being put in place, like the global minimum tax, to, to try to, to be more effective there, so we can look forward to, to these kinds of uh, innovations there um, uh, as they are unfolding. Um, it's interesting um, that Edwin uh, emphasized so much in his, in his remarks the tax shift uh, dimension of all of this. So, um, and also, I mean, the remark, you know, green taxes in particular, planet taxes, uh, taxes on energy use, taxes on greenhouse gas emissions, all these kinds of things. Um, there's there's an um, um, ambition expressed that these could take a more prominent place in, in the tax mix uh, going forward. Um, and that presumably would be part of a tax shift, namely that this kind of would relieve the pressure elsewhere. That's the idea of a tax shift, right? Um, so that's, that's something um, uh, to, to take in, into account there. This is taking place in a very um, dynamic environment relating to energy markets. Uh, with energy prices shooting up in some parts of the world, namely this part of the world, Europe in particular. Um, and as said, strong government responses there, which actually have led to making energy uh, cheaper, at least when it comes to excise taxes paid uh, on energies, but not in the European uh, trading system, right? So the ETS, the EU ETS, co companies pay for their emissions, um, they may receive free permits, depending on what type of company they precisely are. Um, that's a tax-like instrument, which has been much less exposed to downward pressure uh, than excise taxes have been. Um, which means that you know this, this price signal exists, um, and if you look at the sustainability criteria, you see CO2 on top. Uh, you see energy quite high up and you see tax quite low, but there is a very significant tax component to these high-ranked uh, 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 portions. And I think it would be good uh, and useful to com communicate a bit more on what prices companies actually pay for their emissions. And there could be, uh, this could be quite revealing that these prices are quite a bit higher than many think. Um, so that would be something interesting to do. How can this develop? Well, we see Policy asymmetries, high carbon prices in some parts of the world, lower in other parts of the world. That asymmetry is increasing, the gap is rising. Uh, we also see policies, policy asymmetry. Some parts of the world focus more on subsidies for the green transition, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, and, and these kinds of de developments. So positioning uh, in, in that space is going, I think, going to become a, a prime area for for policy development in the coming years, which connects to the tax shift uh, discussion. And that's, I think, where we will see a lot of dynamics. Edwin, how do you think the larger macroeconomic landscape right now is affecting multinationals and their tax burden? I concur with a lot of what Kurt said, I think. You know, I, mean, I mentioned the tax shift. It's not only more green taxes or planet taxes versus lower labor taxes. When I look at the debate in the European Union, it's not a very objective, I think, and fact-driven debate at the moment. It's a debate we need more money for all the reasons we said. And let's look at higher corporate income taxes and wealth taxes. That was, you know, the takeaway I got from the EU tax symposium about more a month ago. So I don't have the right answer right now, but what I would find interesting if you know if we would analyze a bit more objectively from a distance fact driven data driven what kind of taxes do we need in the future to have a sustainable tax system and carbon pricing versus incentives could be part of that debate will be part of that debate i think so that's in essence what i'm trying to to convey it's interesting that 
Mrs. von der Leyen, uh, Georgieva of the World Bank, and uh, Ojonja of uh, the WTO gave a well strong signal that they are in favor, not personally, I think, many of the institutions in the Financial Times this week, that carbon pricing indeed would be a good instrument and maybe as a policy option to be favored uh, above incentives, because that seems to be the case, that we are sort of in a incentive or subsidy uh, competition, the US versus the um, European Union. And, and, and with subsidies only we and incentives, we complicate the tax system, we have all kinds of issues with with um, the global minimum tax. As Peter said, I think, uh, while I think there's too little debate on what is the best policy option. Is that carbon pricing or is that providing incentives to, to companies? Um, when I look at the European Union and also elsewhere, I think, you know, through policy choices by providing incentives, uh, reducing excises on fossil uh, fuel, for example, giving, uh, uh, households and, and car drivers uh, reductions of, of fuel taxes uh, that they give wrong price signals I think to consumers that doesn't help in in accelerating the green transition and it makes the issue of you know huge spending increasing deficits in the deficits in the only worse I think you know so it's they're not when we look at the policy signals the policy choices the policy instruments they're not always aligned I think conflicting, conflicting with the overall goals. So, and I think a debate on that in the European Union, also I think in the OCD, that would be be very helpful. A study like you did, Kurt, in 2010, Tax Policy Reform and Economic Growth. It would be great if the OCD would sort of update that study with current insights, all the discussions around carbon prices versus uh, green incentives, and, and look at, you know, what, what are better and preferred policy choices when you look at the tax system uh, in order to face the challenges we see for the, for, the coming, for the coming period. Peter, on this issue that Edwin was mentioning, a tax shift and the different approaches uh, with incentives and subsidies that we're seeing in various parts of the world, we've got the IRA with tax incentives that's not really possible at EU level here, so we've got a subsidy approach, we've got carbon pricing here in the EU, we don't have carbon pricing in the US at a national level. Um, how does that context of these different approaches affect the tax sustainability of multinationals who are operating in different jurisdictions? Well, to make the concrete example of the global minimum tax, <laughs> the, the I think we have still not understood what the impact will be. Because with the system of allowing tax credits as subsidies, of course we will see that most countries that have granted either lower tax rates or tax incentives by way of you know, applying special tax rates or, reduce or lowering the base, all these countries will transform their systems into de facto subsidies. And I think we have not yet understood the impact. Again, the Barbados example is just extreme. And for me, that's an ab absurd example. If you, if you have a salary of 100 and you get a 300 subsidy by the government, this is not how things should be. So personally I believe implementing a global minimum tax by not at the same time regulating at least parts of the subsidy side does not make sense. Because the system, as Edwin mentioned, will just become more complex. And there is another disadvantage. It will become also more corruptive because asking for a subsidy there, you know, you have a debate with someone at the government whether you get money or not, but asking for a tax exemption to start your business, the debate is different. So probably we will also see more scandals in the future, sorry to be frank here, because when there are subsidy payments, we have seen that in the COVID uh, the crisis in a lot of governments, there is corruption, there is bribery. And if we are only asking about the tax exemption, the risk of bribery corruption is lower. So I think that is a negative impact I see in the sustainability area of the global minimum tax, which does not regulate at least the, the important part of the subsidy payment. Of course, it provides limits to, yes, it needs to be a qualified refundable tax credit or a marketable transferable tax credit. But beyond that, it doesn't tell the governments where is the limit. And the Barbados example just shows there is no limit. I mean. 
but yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I get emotional when I talk about, <laughs> you know, the transfer, <laughs> the Barbados example. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I, I think it doesn't make sense. Well, Michael, what's your opinion on these different approaches? Yeah, it's interesting the, um, the, the way the debate has gone here, because to me, the, the carbon tax shift, the green tax shift, if you like, we, we talk about it a lot here. But it, let's be honest, if we look at the data, it's not happening yet, right? And there are certain industries that is clear from our, our study, certain industries are highly impacted, as you'd expect, the oil industry, the extractive industry, um, those where there's a very direct link. But um, there are other industries like our own in financial services where the total planet taxes we pay is minimal. Um, so there needs to be a refocus on that if we're going to change that going forward. But coming to your sort of original question as to what are we worried about today because of the, the macro environment, I think the biggest pressure on most multinationals is cost. And I think it's cost management and trying to keep an, a balance on that as we try and grow our way out of the crisis that we've just been through um, while sort of managing to do that in a sustainable way. And you know, one of the points that Petter made earlier on around um, the rating agencies and tax was very interesting because he, sort of, he alluded there to, to the fact you know, that rating agencies give you a different rating. Now, for, for most organizations, that determines then how much it's going to cost you to go to market. So how much is it going to cost you to run your business? If your tax is going to play into that, then it's really important that we can, we can show that, that there's a direct link between that and that your rating agencies will see you in, in the way that makes, therefore, your cost of capital more, more efficient. I think also it's worth picking up on the point that's been alluded to a couple of times around the global minimum tax. Now, I'm sure everyone, if you're dialing into this webinar, will be more than familiar with the global minimum tax. In my view, an incredibly well-intentioned piece of legislation, and I think it's you know, a really impressive effort. But I think overall, I would still question whether the cost-benefit analysis of that has that been worthwhile. When we're in a position now where organizations have to deal with all these changes, to, to our organization and to many I speak to, the, the global minimum tax is much more now a compliance exercise than it is a revenue raising exercise. So are we going to see much more tax coming out of it? No, not really. Yeah, perhaps there are examples in places like Barbados, if they don't introduce their tax credits, or Bahamas, where we will see more tax coming out. But most organizations pay tax above 15% anyway. Um, so all we have to do now is just comply with a whole new raft of regulations and report that as of next year and comply with that in a couple of years' time. So it feels like we're just getting more leverage on that, and that's putting more pressure on our cost base. And then as a tax function in-house, your role becomes more difficult because you're managing that increased compliance burden, um, and you're not able to focus on what you really should be doing, which is kind of steering the business and helping, helping the business take tax into account when it's making decisions. Kirk, do you share that perception of the global minimum tax? What do you think? <laughs> uh, not entirely, no. Um, so, uh, indeed, I mean, I, I don't think this, this should be an elaborate pillar to, to uh, discussion in, entirely, but some, some brief reactions. Um, on, on the tax incentive side, I mean, I, I think you said the Barbados example is extreme. I think, indeed, it is extreme, right? I mean, there is uh, a whole different way much more, um, let's say, um, economically useful in which uh, Pillar 2 uh, disciplines the use of tax incentives. Um, first of all, I mean, Pillar 2 is for companies in scope. Second, um, it is, um, it is um, um, about effective tax rates. So uh, the global minimum tax is ultimately going to be um, less constraining for those types of tax incentives that go mainly via uh, cost-based um, um, channels and, and these will be more feasible under Pillar 2 than the ones that are applicable purely to, to let's say, uh, exemptions on, on profit taxes and these kinds of things. So um, um, if you therefore look at the history of economic analysis of, of tax incentives, for investment, there's always been this discussion, and we've been having it to some extent. You know, uh, there can be a role of for tax incentives um, if you want to steer investment, if you uh, want to steer investment in particular directions, like we want to do with the uh, with the green uh, transition, or if we want to, tr to attract uh, investments into our countries. We see a role, but the way tax incentives have often been designed so far. Uh, does not align with that role uh, that well all often uh, all that all that often because of you know design choices that uh, don't really create the strong investment incentives that we uh, expect from these systems so that's the economic analysis and i think you can uh, see quite clearly that the way um, 
uh, Pillar 2 is going to interact with these systems, um, creates a space and a rationale for improving the use of tax incentives uh, from, from an economic uh, perspective. So I think that in that sense there's, let's say, um, a good direction of travel that comes from the pillar uh, in that sense, which I would argue is, is likely to be more important than the extreme examples that we see there. Now, on the extreme examples, it's tax policy, right? It's not subsidy policy. I mean, and this is always a difficult one. So how far do you think uh, you should go with, with your tax um, reform? If you keep adding elements, it will just become more difficult. And well, choices have been made there and have been negotiated. So these are choices that, that, that we work with. Um, um, on the other part, um, so the, the more macroeconomic uh, function, I think it's important to emphasize that the pillar, um, pillar two, um, is about revenue and for revenue analysis, wait and see, stay tuned, new results in the pipeline. Um, but uh, it's not just about revenue, it is, I mean, the first function is to limit tax competition to limit tax competition so that the role of taxation in, um, in deciding for firms to decide where they're going to be allocating their capital is going to be less tax driven and more driven therefore by economic factors, economic factors um, uh, related to the return uh, on investment, therefore to efficient uh, um, um, capital allocation. Um, and um, it probably would be good if, if that um, element of, of the pillar uh, would be taken into account m more in, in, in the discussion rather than this narrow um, uh, focus on, on revenues and, and then um, having discussions on what is a small or a big number. That's, that's what I would say. Yeah, Edwin? What you said is interesting, I think, uh, Kurt. It's, it's about principles of sound tax policy like neutrality, equity, uh, complexity, administratability, etc. And that's what we often seem to have forgotten in many countries. We have built very complex tax systems with constituencies behind every exception in the system. It's so hard to change those systems again into something that makes more sense from an economic perspective that drives change, that drives the greening of the economy, that helps companies to drive change, I think. And, and that is, I don't have an answer to that, but it's what, that's what I observe, you know, it's politically so complex to get changes in the system in a meaningful way to drive any transition we want. Uh, that I'm sometimes a bit pessimistic about the capabilities, maybe specifically looking at the Netherlands right now after the elections, uh, the capabilities of politics to, to, well, get united on any change in the right direction. Uh, what I see is that they make systems only more complex, building in, again, wrong price signals um, without any solution to, to real problems. And that's where organizations like the uh, OCD, IMF, and, and I see Sean Bray of the Tax Foundation can help. I think they can help the thinking of the politicians on how, how to really get to a meaningful tax policy reform, which is absolutely necessary at the moment, I think. Let's talk a bit about public perception. So Michael mentioned at the beginning that um, you know, we see portrayals of multinational tax burdens, which may or may not be accurate. Um, Peter, I wanted to ask you, based on your report, um, do you think that the, the public perception of multinational tax burdens, but also the sustainability of the tax systems on multinationals, is it accurate? Is it fair? That's a very challenging question, to be honest. Uh, I think it really depends. Um, I think we have seen over the past years also, you know, a bit slowing down process of the public debate about aggressive tax planning, uh, you know, since, since the BEPS project uh, um, was finished. I think that is something we, we see in the media. So the huge tax scandals, they don't appear that often anymore, but I think you did a study on that last year. So I'm happy to hear your, your remark whether, whether my uh, subjective uh, experience is, is accurate. Uh, but it, it's, it's highly difficult for me to give you a, a clear answer to your question, to be honest. Michael, yeah, tell us what you guys have, particularly in that study, but what you've observed on this subject, uh, both in public perception and in media portrayals. Yeah, sure. So I, I think 
from, from my perspective, I just think that the media portrayal hasn't yet caught up with the reality of where the tax function is and where tax is being paid at the moment. So I, I think it's fully deserved to look back over the last 20, 25 years of history and say, well, have multinationals always been in the right place when it comes to tax burdens? Massive generalisation, of course. But I think it's fair to say not always. Um, tax avoidance was clearly something that was, the line was always between tax avoidance and tax evasion. Um, tax functions spent a lot of time looking at how can we minimise our tax burden through clever structuring or whatever else it may be. Um, quite honestly, I think that world is almost dead to the extent that it exists. It's in very small pockets now. Um, and the debate now is much more around tax planning, which in many cases isn't really planning at all. It's more around making sure you don't necessarily pay more tax than you have to, because that's uneconomic and your business will go out of business, but paying an absolute amount that you should pay. So recognising the kind of responsible taxpayer role. Now, I think that's where the tax function is today. If you then look at what's happened in the media, the media focus and, and the study we did with the University of Amsterdam last year sort of really showed this. The media coverage is still overwhelmingly negative, and it still focuses quite a lot on the big scandals. So we have the names, and I won't name any of the companies, but I think we've all sort of aware of the big tax cases and scandals or whatever we've had over the last few years. They still make the headlines, um, and they're the ones where, I suppose that's fair enough, right? I mean, who wants to write about tax being paid. It's not very exciting, is it? So you, you, write the, you write the stuff that makes the headlines. But it would be nice for that tax debate just to be moving into, and it's getting there, but it's not quite caught up, I think, with the reality on the ground. Um, Kurt, do you agree that the public perception and the media portrayal has not caught up with companies' current practices when it comes to tax avoidance, tax, tax evasion, and good tax practices? It's, an, it's a very interesting question, and it's not really one that I'm uh, all that qualified to, to shed light on, I think. But I, I was quite struck by, by the uh, description of you know, how uh, professionals uh, describe, um, let's say, sustainability and, and the tax dimension of that, and how that's all over the place. Uh, all kinds of different uh, views, and, and then taxation is... is not at the top of the ranking, but then, of course, if a scandal erupts, it may very well uh, become top of the agenda quite quickly. And uh, this is not something that is, I think, that easy to manage with uh, more transparency on, on, on data and, and these kinds of things. I mean, this is really like a communication exercise to handle. Uh, I mean, of course, we being the OECD, we put a lot of emphasis on, on providing more data, more transparency, and all these kinds of things, which, um, which um, is, is entirely useful. Um, and as I said in, in, in the introduction, um, the role of m and in um, tax administration is disproportionately large compared to, to its role in, in the taxes that it actually pays. Um, this is something probably that, that could be emphasized more. Um, there was an OECD study done in, in 2017. It's actually listed in the study. Um, uh, businesses as a whole now uh, remit 97% um, of all taxes, right? So they're absolutely key in, in, in tax uh, administration uh, and, and implementation. Um, and I think more transparency there and on, on this role there and a, a more positive view on how um, businesses help tax policy happen actually through that role is I think something that that could could become more of a positive um, um, communication uh, campaign or strategy instead of focusing only on where things go wrong right I mean which is which is not the main issue actually Edwin do you think that public perception and media portrayals matches reality at the moment well, I, I don't think so. But the question, you know, is that that relevant or, or not? You know, what can we do? I think what can multinationals do? I think you know to to change that narrative, to change that that perception, because it's very hard. You know, I worked in government for a long time. I had to fight perceptions. Um, now at PwC, I have to fight some perceptions too at the moment. Um, but I've seen things developing, you know, in the right way. Of course, tax is still a cost of capital, as Michael said. You know that's that's an economic fact, I think. But I've seen the way we advise multilateral multinational companies, the way multilateral multinational companies approach tax, uh, change very much over the nearly nine years I'm now at PwC. Tax is still a cost, you know. But the cheapest option is not always the best option. It's 
about wider considerations. It's how will stakeholders view, that's actual conversations we have, how, we con how will stakeholders view a certain course of action, a certain, well, sort of planning, you know, if, if you wish. Uh, so that has changed, I think, dramatically over the years. And I think, you know, it's, when you talk about tax reporting, that sounds very static, like we produce data and some explanation to it. But if you, and that's, I think, a challenge for all of us, you know, if we would try to approach tax even more holistically and connect tax to ethical, societal and sustainable development expectations and communicate o on that, I think there is a potential, I think, uh, to change the perception and have an even better narrative than you have now at EBTF with this great report, I think, because it speaks for itself, but still people need a additional layer of communication, I think, and that, that should connect to those broader expectations of society on sustainability, ethics, etc., etc. I think then th there's, there's a way forward, I think. Yeah. Peter, you wanted to respond? Yes, I, and I think that's it's important for all of us that, you know, in the next year, years we try to highlight that the corporate income tax it is not a steering tax at all. <laughs> so, we, for instance, you know, it is often assumed that higher corporate income tax will lead to less inequality. That's empirically not evident. It can, yes, but it's empirically not evident. But we have great examples where we, where we can draw a really a precise line between a tax and an impact on society, for instance, sin taxes. I mean, tobacco taxes have been a success, have been a huge success. But we are not able to, you know, transform that into the public perception. Because if we see that as an example, we can also potentially demonstrate that using fuel taxes, etc., we could achieve the transformation rather soon. And I think the focus on corporate income tax as, you know, a solution for basically all problems there are in the world, I think that's, that's dangerous. Because it is not, I mean, incidents, we, we still don't know <laughs> who really bears the cost of the corporate income tax. It depends on markets, it depends on, on the company. And I think it's dangerous when we then, you know, um, have a message that raising corporate income tax leads to less inequality. Because it's simply not, it depends on transfer, it depends on incidents. So we should focus on, on messages which are evidently true based on data. Edwin, you wanted to respond? Interesting, it connects to the, what you said, Peter, and also to what you presented, I think, you know, the, the first chart with the conclusions, uh, where you asked the um, companies what would be your main priority issues to tackle in your enterprise, and then CO2, greenhouse gas emissions, fair employment, diversity, etc. was on the top five, I think, while tax is on the 10th place. I would say that tax is part of all these issues. Tax can help drive, you know, lower greenhouse gas emissions, it can help drive more fair employment, it can help, you know, uh, well, influence uh, energy uh, consumption. So that's what I also meant by the holistic uh, discussion, not disconnect tax from all the other issues, but make tax a part of that discussion and see tax, you know, as a driver, but also as a consequence of, of, of change sometimes. Uh, so that, that is, I think, more the debate we ought to have together, you know. Tax is an element of all those sustainable development issues and not, and you mentioned the SDGs, uh, court, that, that's also true of course, but more, looking more at the report of San Gallo, I think that is very important. Tax is part of that and could drive change. Well, on that topic, Michael, how do you think MNCs could improve their communication about how they pay taxes? I think, yeah, I think to the point Edwin just made, I think one of the key things we could do is focus much more on the role within the ESG space. So if you can demonstrate um, you know, how tax contributes to each of those parts, um, you know, whether it's the environment side with the carbon taxes, the, the incentives in the investment into infrastructure that many organisations are taking on board, or the societal contribution, which I mean, I think tax is probably still the biggest source of government income globally by some way, or, or whether it's just the governance, which is around the behaviour and the policy and how we all, all manage that. I think if we can get that message across, then it can be seen that actually a lot of what MNEs are doing is a force for good in that area. Um, and not just a sort of, uh, not just out there for themselves. I mean, the other piece I think, just very, you know, from our own observation, is, is getting your own people involved. So if you work in a multinational, and the people today are much more aware of tax, they're much more aware of this whole issue, and, and they like to be engaged in the debate. So one of the things we found as an organisation at Swiss Re was when you publish things like your total tax contribution, 
the employees actually engage in that, I mean, and you generally get relatively positive feedback from that, and lots of people sort of pleased that you're showing that actually we're a good company that's paying the right amount of tax, we've got a responsible behaviour out there. That, that's, that's a good way of getting the story out there as well. Well, let's take some questions that have come in from the audience via Slido. Again, you can type in your questions on Slido. I'll read them out to the panelists. Uh, first question is for you, Peter. Uh, it's from Ati Demiraj. You noted the company's tax contribution impacts tax tax contribution impact depends on how governments use taxes. Do you agree that there should and can be oversight on tax usage, like reviewing of public budgets and ultimately voting accordingly? Yes, that's an important debate. That just maybe two aspects. One is there is a debate going on under the title budgeting for SDGs. So countries should actually look at their budget and assess and for what SDG they could have the highest impact uh, by investing public revenue. So I think that's a very important debate. And second of all, to make a, an example now, Germany. Germany is fascinating because there was a decision of the Federal Supreme Court uh, a few weeks ago um, on the debt break. So Germany is basically not allowed to you know, spend more unless they get more revenue. And there you have the direct link. Either you really can have a clear message that we need more revenue, basically introducing a wealth tax or higher income taxes, or we need to make sure that we have less spending. And then we have a, then we have a transparent debate. But normally in our uh, countries, you don't have the transparent debate about the two. You just talk about the revenue side or you talk about the spending side. But that needs to be connected all the time. And that's difficult, but things like a debt break helps you to, to link the two because once you run out of money, you need to save somewhere. And it's either military, it's social security, or it's something else. And, and then people realize that, you know, we have reached a limit. Uh, we cannot collect more revenue than right now in Germany. And I think that's the debate they're having. So Germany is a fascinating example right now. Of yeah. course, with all its disadvantages, and, uh, but from an academic perspective, it's fascinating. Interesting, and it is it's quite unique, their debt break, so it's also interesting how Germany compares, even with other EU countries, when something like this happens with the constitutional court decision. Um, Kurt, the next question is for you. Uh, the question is from Catherine Acosta. What is your opinion on the UN recent decision for establishing a framework convention on tax? Is that perceived as the UN stepping into the OECD's shoes? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Sorry. I, I wasn't aware that that was the, the topic of, of this discussion, so I, I, I'm really not going to be commenting all, on that all that much. Uh, but, 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 I mean, um, this, this view has, expressed at, uh, has been expressed at the UN, and this is an evolution that we um, at, at the OECD obviously um, um, are, are uh, quite aware of, and we, we will be looking forward to seeing how this is uh, going to, to interact that with the work that we do. I mean, we do think that the OECD has a strong and quite positive track record in, in some of uh, these areas that, that uh, um, are being mentioned as potentially areas of work for, for the UN. So um, that's there. Uh, we will engage in positive uh, discussions on that. And meanwhile, we will try to continue the work that we're doing and try to complete some of these tasks that we're undertaking. By the way, if anyone else wants to jump in on any of these questions, just let me know. Um, we have had a couple questions come in on the planet taxes issue. Um, so I'm going to take the first one out of several here. Um, so this question is from Sean Bray. Um, Michael, I'm going to put this to you. The question is, how should the EU compete in a subsidy-driven world under Pillar 2 without tax competence? So I think this is referring to the IRA and the fact that the, it is made up of tax um, incentives and at the EU level, since tax is not a competence or it requires unanimity, we can't do that at EU level. Um, how should the EU compete with the IRA and the tax incentives if it can't actually enact its tax policy? It's a great question. So I think if you asked... Um, <laughs> any of my fellow panellists who are probably much closer to the EU than I am in terms of not being headquartered here. Um, I, I mean, they're, they're clearly there's good moves in terms of the BFIT and trying to get a common consolidated tax base, whatever the current name 
may be, which I think is probably the best way of doing that. So you can actually make effectively free to movement of tax and, and establishment across the EU. Then it becomes much more effective for organisations to be established here um, and to be able to trade amongst the EU in a way that is compat competitive. Um, otherwise, I think that the hands are naturally tied to an extent in that area. I mean, maybe, and this is where maybe going to the positive side of, of what you know, the work that Kurt and others have been involved in. Maybe this is where the global tax can actually have a benefit as well, though, because it does, as as he said, it puts a floor around sort of profit shifting. It, it sort of makes other more established jurisdictions like the EU more attractive in terms of locations because you're not necessarily looking to go out and really shop around for where your locations. Not, not that many organisations do this now anyway, but where you might want to set up in a, in a lower tax haven. Um, yeah, Kurt, did you want to respond to that? Because obviously, so one of the concerns here is that the IRA can lure companies away from Europe by using these tax incentives that Europe can't offer because uh, treaty-wise, its hands are tied. Um, is, are there global solutions to that? Well, I mean, there are discussions. So basically, schematically, the difference is this, that one part of the world, the EU, uh, focuses heavily on carbon pricing as the lead instrument. It's not the only instrument, it's the first uh, important observation to make, uh, whereas the US now has stepped up climate ambition and is working more through um, 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 tax incentives as the principal mechanism to, to deliver support. Um, so, okay, um, that's a situation um, which, is, which is emerging. We see that the EU is taking steps to make sure that its focus on pricing um, is kind of balanced by a price on the carbon content of imports with the border carbon adjustment. So that's some kind of uh, approach to, to avoiding, um, um, you know, uh, carbon leakage, but potentially also on cost asymmetries for, for companies. Um, so that, that's one response which, which is happening. Um, I would, for the rest, just in general say, um, of course, and it won't surprise anyone that has looked at my past work that I'm a big fan of carbon pricing. But carbon pricing is not the only uh, element of a climate transition policy package. Um, and this is, I think, um, something that's relevant to this debate with, with uh, large enterprises. Uh, the green transition is not about reducing emissions by 10% or something. No, it's moving to net zero, right? This is an economic transformation. Um, and that economic transformation um, is, to a very large degree, uh, an investment problem, actually. So it's the investments in low carbon assets, zero carbon assets, that we need to focus on as a policy priority. Um, it's in that sense that this, this tax incentive approach in the Inflation Reduction Act um, economically does make some sense. Um, it would be better if it were combined with carbon pricing. It's always a policy package. Uh, but tax incentives can have a role to play, do have a role to play. More broadly, technology support does have a role to play in, in a low carbon uh, transition policy. It does play that role in the EU as well. It takes a different form because of the constraints on tax. Uh, but at the same time, if you look very closely, it's not like these components are absent from the EU policy. So I wouldn't uh, be too... Um, pessimistic, let's say, about the extent to which the Inflation Reduction Act and what it brings immediately poses a problem for the policy strategies that the EU deploys in, it, in its climate action. Well, you mentioned carbon pricing. The other two questions on this topic are about carbon pricing. Peter, I'll put them to you. I'll put both of these to you. So the first one is from Sandra Wenzel. What role can carbon taxes play in promoting sustainability and at the same time contribute to economic growth? And the second question is from Trilling from Eurodad. How would a system of green taxes for MNEs look like if the entire ecological footprint is taken into account? Well, Kurt mentioned that he's the expert on carbon pricing, so I. I, I try to, you know, shift the first question to him, but I agree fully with him that, you know, pricing is, will be the key element to, <laughs> to have a green transition. Um, just um, uh, maybe a, as a, a, an add, uh, you know, to what, what he said. Um, this morning I 
came here by train, now I'm flying back to Switzerland. And yesterday I had a discussion with a colleague uh, in, in, in Switzerland. Um, and I was still surprised that, you know, aviation fuel, for instance, we're still, we're still not able to tax aviation fuel. So the aviation industry benefits a lot from subsidies through tax expenditure. And not just, you know, exemption from, from mineral ta I mean, oil taxes, but also VAT exemption, special treatment under VAT regimes. So I think there are some low-hanging fruits also on the expenditure side. But I'm uh, fully in agreement with Kurt. Pricing is, is, is the key out of, out of, um, out of um, the, the, the green transition. Um, and with respect to the second um, uh, question, both are really difficult, so I tend to you know, shift that to, to Michael on, on how to calculate <laughs> the footprint for a, for a whole multinational. Um, but I think that's the debate we need to have um, because you're in, in the service industry and of course the service industry has per se less impact. Mm. So if you compare it to the cement industry, I mean, sometimes I think people compare apples and pears and, and, and I think that's important that we have transparency um, because the service industry, sorry to be provocative here, but for Swiss Re it's easy to have net zero. But for no, I'm you know I'm really provocative. <laughs> but 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 for Holzim, another company that is based in Switzerland, it's extremely difficult to have net zero, and so we have we need to be careful to compare non-competitors in in that area. Um, but I hand over to you too. Sorry. Yeah, Michael, what's your take on what such a system where the entire ecological footprint were taken into account? What would that look like? I mean, honestly, I, I think it's hard to add to what Petter said. So, I mean, I won't go into company specifics, but, but he's absolutely right. You, you can't expect a, a, a financial services company to, to suddenly shift towards paying carbon and production taxes. It just, it just isn't enough there. It would have to be some form of security transaction type taxes as well. Um, so so I would, I, I would, I'd say that needs to be looked at in, in a huge amount of detail. Um, I mean, one thing also that sort of very recently and maybe I can pass this on also. Um, but from a policy perspective, just thinking about the, you know, the whole kind of carbon discussion and the fact that the IRA has come out and, and, and the impact of that, is, do we think, um, and maybe this is one for Edwin, the, the case, I think there was a case yesterday heard at the Supreme Court that's now effectively could have a huge impact on the US revenue, the, um, the change in, I believe it's uh, the Moore's case, but basically it's all about ha whether or not you can tax income that is not effectively remitted or, or actually repatriated to the, to the owner of that income, which has a huge impact on the way the US tax system works. Do you think that's going to have an impact on this going forward, given their role as a leader and any risk of contagion? And um, a policy, uh, apologies for dumping it on you, but I know as a policy guy, you're probably closer to that than I am. I'm not really familiar with the Moore case. Oh, uh, it's literally yesterday, so I, I was can, just... I can add oh, please do, yeah. yeah great. Uh, there was the oral hearing, and, and I think the first feedback is there won't be probably a majority right. um, in favour of the appellant. So probably things will stay as they are, but that's the, the, the feedback I got today, and I heard part of the oral uh, argumentation yesterday. So probably we don't see sub-chapter F <laughs> getting <laughs> repealed, etc. So the impact is less than people expected, but we don't know yet. Okay. Just on the Moore versus United States case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so that moves us back into a world where, yes, we need to develop a green tax system. Um, and maybe that's then back to Kurt again. As the yeah, Kurt, <laughs> do you want to take this as well? Uh, well, I mean, what, what's the full footprint of a company or a household? Um, that, that's quite difficult. I mean, we, we would have to break down their production consumption patterns, see what what polluting inputs are, are being consumed and all these kinds of things. Um, so I guess um, in, in designing this kind of uh, tax shift approach, I would look at trying to put a price on, on the polluting inputs and not necessarily think so much about what the full uh, um, ecological or uh, environmental footprint of a company is, but rather break it down into its components and try to tax or price, because it's not always tax, we have emissions trading systems, try to do that where the tax base um, is appropriate, right? And you'll see huge differences uh, ac across uh, households and across companies in, in those profiles. Um, what would it mean in terms of, let's say, tax revenue and, and, and all these kinds of things? Well, very difficult, uh, obviously, but order of magnitude-wise, you could maybe 
if you went quite far in using price instruments as a driver for, for trying to reduce pollution and trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, maybe you could kind of in the medium term double the tax take from environmentally related taxes compared to what we have now, uh, which means it's, it's meaningful, uh, which also means it's not a tax revolution, right? I mean, um, you're going to be able to use this to maybe reduce some taxes in the CIT space, maybe some in the PIT space. That's going to depend on, on your um, country-specific conditions, what's best. And we see how all these different types of revenue use do occur. And it's interesting in, in terms of, you know, this the, the remark that was made earlier. Um, should there be oversight on how revenues are used? The idea of reserving the revenues from environmentally related taxes for specific uses is quite strong. It's much stronger than in other uh, areas of, of taxation. Uh, so that's quite striking and it looks like there the political economy, the path forward is indeed to combine those discussions and to say, you know, we're going to increase taxes on pollution there and the revenue we're going to be using to reduce this business tax or to reduce uh, this um, 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 personal income tax element. Um, there is emerging evidence that the most favored way of um, reserving the revenue is simply to say, if we're going to price carbon, which is a subset of environmental taxes, but if we are going to price carbon, then the best way to use the revenue from a political economy point of view is to reserve it for climate spending, spending namely climate investment. And that's, I think, an interesting uh, proposition to work with, which, which, which can take us forward. Uh, and which is compatible with using it for, for support for in low carbon investments, for example. Um, so I think that's, that's promising, but at the same time, tax shift, yes, but really a full transformation of the tax system, no. Uh, which means that this increased fiscal pressure that we're going to be faced with, we'll have to work with the tools that we have, right? So it's going to be really difficult, I think. Okay, I have one last question from the audience before we go to the closing statements. This question is from Michael. It's from Boris Azais. Is the preferred tax regime provided by French authorities very selectively to a short list of national champions? Is that being debated at EBTF? Is it sustainable? And how different is it from direct subsidies? I'm going to have to take a bit of a pass on this one. I'm looking around the room to see if any of my French EBTF colleagues are here. Um, I can answer simply that we're not debating at EBTF because I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not familiar with it. So I don't know if any of my fellow panelists are either. No, okay. Well, it's, oh, a, it's a black box. It's a, it's a little <laughs> bit of a bespoke area, I think. Okay, cool. Let's move on to closing statements. So I'm curious to hear from each of you what your key takeaway is uh, from today's discussion, and in particular, what you think the, the months and years ahead are going to bring um, for MNCs in terms of taxation. Kurt, let's start with you. Um, what kind of stood out to you uh, from, from this discussion today, particularly when looking ahead to the future? Thanks. Um, so it's a very interesting uh, discussion and, and a very interesting set of reports. Um, I think what stands out for me is that the, the discussion on, on you know, how to measure, uh, how to establish to what extent uh, we sustainability and tax uh, correlated, that this is very difficult, um, but that there nevertheless is, is, is uh, a big job to be done in terms of communicating therefore providing the data on what, uh, what businesses are doing in terms of paying taxes and in terms of, um, in terms of um, um, collecting the taxes and, 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 and uh, administering them. So there's much work to be done there, I think. And the other thing uh, that stands out is I think that all of us seem, seem to agree that things will get more difficult in the next couple of years as fiscal space tightens as the expectations on what tax delivers, should deliver, actually are increasing, the number of goals just broadens, right? And the trade-offs between them will become increasingly obvious as, as we enter in, into this difficult fiscal position, I think. Edwin, what's your key takeaway? Indeed, two interesting reports that clearly show, I think, that we don't have a clear definition yet on what 
sustainability in the context of tax is. Uh, I also see, and you said it, Peter, it's, it's chaos when you look at reporting standards and rating agencies. How is tax, you know, part of the total rating? I think, you know, more uniformity would be, would be welcome, I think, not only for multinational companies, but also for the uh, public at large. Uh, and even, you know, a global tax contribution, total tax contribution standard in the context of a sustainability reporting that, that would be a great step, I think, you know, uh, that would help companies, policymakers, but also uh, the audience. Uh, and one last remark, I think, you know, we don't always see how tax can play a role in all the more obvious discussions on sustainability, like greenhouse gases, CO2 emissions, etc. And that's, I think we could, uh, we, I mean, also PwC could do a bit more, I think, you know, to explain that those topics are interconnected and that tax can really help driving change in the other areas uh, too. Peter, what are your closing thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think um, that uh, we should have more uh, open discussions as we have had today. Um, and, and the goal should be first to understand what are the limits of tax systems when we talk about the sustainability the goals. And there are a lot of limits. Again, corporate income tax is not an effective tool to achieve many of the SDGs directly. Planet taxes might be uh, if uh, uh, in, in a very specific area. Second of all, there is no way around talking about spending of uh, uh, governance. And, and I think the next years, maybe the pendulum will shift to the other side and we will have more debates about what is, uh, um, what is an efficient uh, spending to achieve you know, the sustainable development goals. And finally, Michael. Uh, yeah, I think um, I, I'm encouraged that the uh, discussion around sustainability and tax is becoming more engaged and we're getting such great input and it's you know great to have so many uh, influential people here uh, in part of that panel as well i think it, we show with these reports that we've been producing now for five years that tax is the contribution from multinationals is so important the focus shouldn't just be on corporate for income tax so how do we then report that and how do we make sure that tax is recognized as a key part of a country a company's sustainability journey trying to narrow down those standards as the more reporting standards come out, trying to get a bit more focus around that feels to me to be the next direction of travel here. Great. Well, I want to thank all the panelists for some great contributions and also the audience for some great questions, uh, particularly some things I hadn't thought about before. So that's, that's quite interesting. How about a round of applause for our excellent panelists here? So thank you so much to everyone here in the room and online for joining us for today's event. If you are watching us from home, I wish you an excellent rest of your evening. If you're here with us in the room, I invite you outside for some networking and more tax chat over some refreshments. Have a great evening. Mm -hmm.